Hello and welcome to the society with Fatma Shaheen at PTP World. Today on our show, we'll be talking about the education system as it has evolved in the Pakistani society. We'll not only be talking about the very core fundamentals of our education system, but we'll also be talking about what role can education in Pakistan or for that matter in any other country actually play when it comes to ensuring societal progress. We'll be talking about the changing trends in this regard. We'll also be talking about our move towards a more digital digitized education system, more particularly post the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll also be talking about the need for there to be not only greater inclusion, but also by that virtue, greater diversity in the education system. What work has been done in this regard? We'll also be talking about overall the policies, the strategies, and of course, the initiatives that have been taken by the government and generally not only to improve the overall quality, but also to improve the overall access to the education system in Pakistan. All of this today, that too with a very enlightened panel. Let me introduce you to my today's panel. My first panelist for today's show is uh, Ms. Talha Fayaz, who is the former lecturer at HEC Pakistan. My second panelist for today's show is Ms. Gulay Mariam, who is the board member of Punjab Curriculum and Textbook Board, and she's also the board member of National Curriculum Council of Pakistan. She's also the director of Rural Development Foundation for Pakistan District Okara. Assalamu alaikum, madam, and welcome to the show. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for having me. You're most welcome. And via telephone line, we'll be joined by Professor Dr. S. Sohail H. Nakvi Saab, who's not only been the former VC Lums, but he's also been the former executive director at HEC which is the Higher Education Commission, Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum, sir, and welcome to the show. Madam, to start the conversation with you, now we understand at a very basic level that you've not only been working abroad, but also you've had that benefit, rather vast experience of working here in Pakistan, both in the public as well as in the private sector. So if you were to then bifurcate how do you compare and contrast both the education systems in Pakistan to what it is in the United Kingdom? Um, I personally think uh, Pakistan has their own pros um, and cons and mm. uh, similarly in British educational system they have their own positive and negative points as well. A mm. uh, few things I like about Pakistan system is the students are really hard working mm. in Pakistan. Um, in UK what I like about is the customer, the client is your student. Mm. So you have individualized lesson plan, scheme of work, you design your course accordingly. Hmm. So it's not a massive, like there is a slavers in the scheme of work, which will fit everybody. Hmm. So it's very customized to the individual needs of one person. Hmm. Also in this regard, then how would you make a comparison with regards to the teaching methods? Because that we understand are very different as well. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, I personally think the teaching methodology is really mm. flexible, adoptive mm. towards the learners' needs. Mm. Um, and it's, learners are very motivated. One thing I really love about the culture is they love the job. Mm. They work and they love the work, what they do, and they feel pride in it. Mm. And you probably notice that um, the population of UK is probably, you know, uh, not as much like Pakistan, but if you see the growth, economic growth factors and everything is quite high mm. because they really work hard and they are very productive. Mm. So what I notice about them is they really work focused. Mm. So nine to five they work, Saturday, Sunday is off, mm. they don't work, mm. but they produce that work Hmm. you know, in five days, more than, you know. But Madam, then Saturday, <laughs> Sunday is also off here in Pakistan. It's all about your right, not only the teaching methodology itself, but it's also with reference to equipping the educators. Equipping and this is something education. upon which I know you would be able to add to. Because when we talk about strengthening our teachers, when we talk about their capacity building, here we hmm. understand ensuring that they have access to the right resources, ensuring for that matter, they have access to a computer software, or for that hmm. matter, the internet, so to speak. That is of course ensured. So when we talk about this in the context of the digital age that we do live in, because we did see that post the COVID-19 pandemic, Pakistan's traditional education system did make that move towards getting itself digitized. So how would you make that comparison between uh, you know, both the rural as well as the urban areas? Because we do understand that yes, this digital divide, it then doesn't of course exist. Uh, that's a very good question, Fatma, because uh, Pakistan is a 
is a very different uh, country, if I can put it that way. We, 61% um, of our population lives in the rural areas. Hmm. And we have a rural and an urban divide. Then we have, a, uh, if I can say, like we have a private school and a public school divide. Then we have a gender disparity. We have quite a lot of issues that we are dealing with right now. When the pandemic struck and uh, the whole, globally, everyone was uh, affected by it. Pakistani education system, I, if I'm talking about the rural areas and I have an experience working in there, our system was totally shut down. Hmm. Everyone was in shock, and but we were in a bigger shock hmm. because we weren't prepared. Hmm. Uh, you know, in schools and cities, maybe they had an infrastructure, they had computers, they immediately switched to online schooling. Hmm. But uh, schools in rural areas, in government schools, they didn't have a robust infrastructure. They didn't have computers. Over there, we have electricity shortages. Uh, but in this regard, do you not feel then what is equally important is also to consider doing away with those typical social cultural norms when it comes to ensuring access to education, more particularly in the rural areas. Absolutely. There are social uh, sociocultural norms. We live in a patriarchal society mm. and more so in the rural areas, it's very prevalent uh, that the girl child is uh, not encouraged as much. If given an opportunity, mm. if it's in a household and you have a male child and a girl mm. child and the opportunities are less, mm. of course, there will be a preference given to, to the male child to go mm. to school. The girl may be uh, very bright, uh, but uh, more opportunity will be given to the girl. So the social culture cultural um, issues are there. We need to encourage and give awareness to uh, the, the parents first. Mm. And it's a, it is a very vicious cycle. Mm. Uh, poverty leads to illiteracy. Illiter illiteracy leads to unemployment. Unemployment leads to economic instability and the social vices that come in the society. But here, another thing that we must give due consideration to is the fact that, yes, equally, we should consider this entire debate in the context of, of course, our prevailing social cultural norms. On which I'll come to you, Suhail Saab, and then in this context, we must also, of course, talk about the various problems which then do exist, especially with regards to higher education in Pakistan, be it for that matter in the private universities or for that matter in the public university. Uh, so what do you propose should be that ideal method of overcoming the same? Is it strategy that we need to focus upon or for that matter even policy making in this regard? There are three pivotal challenges faced by the higher education system in Pakistan. The first one is governance and management. The second one is that of strategy. And the third one is that of finance. Let me take these up one at a time. In terms of governance, we are talking about the body that will set the policy, the long-term direction, approve budgets, make key appointments in the institution, and look at the overall health of the institution in terms of what it wants to achieve and where it is. The management layer is where the execution of these ideas occur. That is where the rubber hits the road. In private institutions, the problem occurs when we have this idea of an owner uh, institution and they are also the chief executives, then who are they responsible to? Who will question uh, these people? And uh, who will challenge them in terms of ideas uh, that they may have? When we are talking about public sector institutions, again, if we have the vice chancellor chairing the syndicate uh, meeting in which external members are also sitting, then what we have effectively done is mixed up governance and management. Who is uh, the entity, the body, the group of wise people who will be looking at the future plans of the university, approving them, who will be assessing what is going on for the long term? The second uh, challenge is that of strategy, defining what the institution is going to be doing and how is it going to be uh, doing it? Every institution is not going to do the same thing. The third challenge is that of finance. In terms of public sector, the problem is acute as the government has cut back severely on the amount of funds that are available for higher education institutions to uh, operate. In terms of private sector institutions, the challenge is less acute 
but as the economy is not doing well, there is a severe problem there. Uh, that's very rightly put by yourself, sir. The policy is that one thing which will actually help us prioritize and focus on all the same because it will then be that guiding point using which we can actually streamline the entire education process. Uh, but moving on, another question that I would want to put to you in this regard is also the fact that overall we have seen Pakistan's education system transform and change that too for the better, more so, you know, moving towards the digitization of the same too. So in this regard, how do you see this transformation actually happening? To what extent do you feel have we successfully been able to digitize Pakistan's education system or for that matter even incorporate artificial intelligence because we understand that yes that is the new thing and in this regard how important then it is also to consider so as to keep that link between not only the education system but also the respective industry alive because we need to ensure that yes people get the right qualification but the qualification that they are getting is definitely very relevant to the job that they are seeking. The demands of the digital economy are that they require the educational institutions to be in sync with the requirements of the digital economy. These requirements are changing rapidly. Today we have demands for prompt engineering, for example, which is how to use the AI tools that are available. What kind of question would you ask them that they would respond with the information that uh, you seek? We have data visualization. We have enormous amount of data. How do you make sense out of that? How do you get information out of that? And the list goes uh, on and on. So how is a public sector university uh, going to keep pace with these changings? And then should it be keeping pace with these changings uh, all the times? Educational institutions necessarily take a long-term view. They understand that technologies are going to be evolving and they are going to give the tools to the students to be productive in the long term. But they also need uh, to be attuned to the needs of industry. And for that, one excellent mechanism is that of industrial advisory boards that you are taking your uh, curriculum and uh, having it reviewed by industry experts in the relevant division. We can also have uh, industry experts as part of the faculty. There is uh, uh, the entire uh, concept of having industry uh, experts uh, through the mechanism of professors of practice who become a part of the faculty and vice versa. So there is faculty that spends a sabbatical at uh, an industry. And so the linkage with industry is crucial um, for success of an academic institution in the digital age. Right, sir, your point is noted, on which I'll come to you, Ms. Maryam. So how would you respond to that, given, of course, the fact that you yourself have had such vast experience of working both in the public as well as the private sector? It's uh, enlightening to know what Dr. Sab just uh, said and, and what, what all the digital transformation and the plans that we have for Pakistani education system. But we need to be cognizant of the fact that in, in all these endeavors, are we creating a digital divide between the urban and the rural sector mm. yet again? Because what we are trying to do is bridge the gap uh, what we try to do with uh, national curriculum also is that we were trying to bridge the gap and bring a uniformity in the curriculum now in the rural areas we have teachers who are the pioneers of change hmm. those pioneers of change themselves are not skilled enough they are not equipped sometimes hmm. they are not ready they are in their comfort zone they are not hmm. ready to accept that digital change right. they are living in the same traditional methodologies they hmm. they appreciate that because they've been studied that they studied that way we have to first uh, invest into the infrastructure we right. have to make sure we have electricity internet connectivity uh, and all the the things that go with it and mm. then we have to train our teachers there should be enough capacity building professional development of mm. our teachers so that they can uh, they can actually train our kids for the future the digital right. resources also are not uh, uh, they're, they're expensive you mm. can uh, we have whiteboards we uh, we do have technological advancement now we have but you need multimedia we need uh, smartphones we mm. need tablets we need mm. computers not public every public school has those right and then to uh, uh, 
to think uh, if we talk about the, the social sciences and we talk about the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, first the physiological needs of the teachers have to be met before we tell them that you have to go to the final stage uh, mm -hmm. of uh, self-actualization or to motivate them, we have to give them financial benefits, right. we have to pay them right. Uh, that's very rightly put by yourself because in this regard then also Miss Mariam, we will need to ensure at a very basic level that whereas of course we are aiming to overall digitize the entire system, then we also need to ensure that yes, we have the appropriate resources to do the same too. Madam, I'll come to you and I would want to draw upon your international experience in this regard too. When we talk about education, we understand a very important part of the management is also the administration of any respective educational institution. And you've also had that benefit of being an administrator yourself. So what focus can Pakistan place learning from countries in the West, be it UK, be it USA, so as to overall improve its quality of education by strengthening the school or the college administration? First thing is a SWOT analysis. Mm. So they have to analyze the opportunities, the strengths, the weaknesses and the threats. Mm. Because every one uh, country's um, their environment is totally different. The UK has some positive points. They could have some positive points. Mm. Then I would also say that they have to also standardize mm. uh, the quality of teaching. Um, and I would also agree, like uh, the Dr. Saab said, already governance, policy making, mm. and more than policy making, implementation. True. Mm. So we do make policies. Mm. We do have strategic management, administration. Mm. There is a staff handbook. There is continuous professional development, mm. you know, continuously going on to upgrade the system. Mm. But sometimes we don't implement it. True. And there need to be checks and balances that, yes, these are the policies in place. We are implementing them. And then there are regular reviews of the reviews, same too, basically. Yeah. There should be individual, uh, like in UK, we do have individual learner planner mm. where we review the progress of a learner. Mm. And we have over guided learning hours and targets. Mm. And we try to match with it. Mm. And we try to see if there is a gray area, how can we improve it? Mm. And then every learner's is unique right. and we have to find out the gray areas mm. and we try to enhance the skills where we can enhance mm. like some learners could be really good in theory mm. some learners are really good in practical skills mm. some learners are really good in data resolving problem solving so you need to pick up as a teacher you need to pick and choose yeah. but here again then madam we also need to at the same end ensure that yes whatever learning process the children go through it is not only customized but it at the end of the day also gives them that holistic that kind holistic of a learning approach. experience yes. on which I'll come to you again Ms. Mariam and here I would want you to comment on the need for us to ensure that yes whereas of course we are generally aiming to improve the content the curriculum of the education system what is equally important is also to ensure that yes people not only have the right access to it but it is in its own right not only diverse and inclusive per se too now over a period of time we have seen that not one rather quite a few changes have actually been inculcated in the Pakistani curriculum. Could you please enlighten us about the importance of the same and overall improve the quality of education that is being provided? Uh, Fatma, I think we've come a long way. Yeah. Uh, the education policy has been revised and it has been improved for the better. And there are so many competent people who are devising and improvising it every day as we speak. Uh, it is the first time that uh, we are actually recognizing and we are accepting that they are uh, you know, we, we are accepting minorities and their different religions. We, there are seven religions that we, we are having separate textbooks mm. being printed for them. It's mm. in process. And uh, uh, for inclusiveness and diversity, mm. there is no um, hate word or intolerance for any religion or anything True. in our books. And then uh, uh, we have the a bill has been passed for dyslexia. Mm. So we are coming to terms and we are actually recognizing and diag the diagnosis is the first step towards a solution. Right. So we are coming to terms with the fact that there are children with dyslexia, slow mm. learners, and a bill has been passed and we are inculcating it in the curriculum also. Mm. Uh, for the visually impaired, uh, the curriculum is being uh, uh, translated into Braille. Mm. This is the first time it's uh, it's happening in Which Pakistani. Which is exemplary in itself. We've also had in the past uh, transgender schools too. Yes, the first transgender mm. school was set up in, in 2021 mm. in Multan. So you see these are baby steps, but we are 
are getting there. Right. It's an improvement in, in mm -hmm. our curriculum. And mm -hmm. what you were just mentioning that we are we are looking at many different uh, countries and whatever mm -hmm. works for us and with our culture, with our uh, you know social uh, political values and mm -hmm. everything, keeping that intact, we are adopting good things from from the west also and we are incorporating it in in our own curriculum mm. and then we are giving it the provinces can have their own uh, a provincial autonomy is True. there so they can have their own like stories or their own things added uh, into their curriculum right. uh, that's very rightly put by yourself because when we do talk about this particular article article 25 of the pakistani constitution we also understand the provinces have legislated upon the same too so as to enforce it in its letter and spirit on which i'll come to you sohail sahab and here we must talk about uh, the need for us to ensure a rigorous uh, quality assurance that too within the education system itself so as a senior educator and of course as the former executive director of HEC how do you propose can that be done both internally within the education institution itself and externally what kind of checks and balances do we need in place so as to ensure that quality assurance is actually there in spirit the issue of quality is paramount to the work of an educational uh, institution without quality of course you have basically uh, nothing the question becomes as to who owns quality and how is that uh, quality uh, implemented. As far as educational standards are uh, concerned, both in terms of content and processes and uh, uh, we can add delivery uh, to that, these are es essentially benchmarked uh, internationally. You are taking standards uh, that the world has accepted and you are applying them to your particular context in the country. A fabulous example of that is uh, of the Bologna uh, protocol where uh, we now have a group of 50 countries, advanced countries of the world who have agreed that this is the process of uh, quality assurance. Now, one thing that I'd like to make very, very clear is that quality assurance only works if, first of all, the quality is owned by the institution themselves. And what I mean by that is that the institution has systems and processes to assess uh, quality. Simple example would be that uh, there is a mechanism to review the courses that are taught. What was taught? What was delivered? Did you effectively cover the curriculum? Did the students learn properly? Were the exams coverage good? How was the instructor? All of these are not the responsibility of an external body. They are the responsibility of the institution. What an external body of quality assurance does is it comes to the institutions and sees if the internal processes of quality assurance of that institution are working properly. There is no inspector coming to check you. You are responsible for your work. The external party comes and checks to make sure that you are taking that duty seriously. But moving on here, it's very important then to also talk about the need for education to be skill-based and this is something upon which the other panelists earlier during the conversation also deliberated upon. So, sir, how do you see this concept being inculcated in our education system, that too very seamlessly? The issue of skills often comes up in discussions of uh, educational institutions and the question occurs that how much emphasis are you going to put into theory and how much emphasis are you going to put into uh, practice. Now we all know that you learn by doing. So practice is clearly something that is extremely uh, important. But we are also in an uh, education or, uh, uh, institution not uh, looking at uh, producing people who can just simply do something and not understand uh, the mathematical or theoretical basis of what is going on. It would be good to understand here also that there are different types of uh, institutions, educational institutions uh, at the higher uh, level here. In Europe, for example, you have universities of applied sciences. They are focused much more on the application of knowledge. And then you have research universities that are looking at fundamental knowledge. Both are important. The company uh, that I have formed and now working at is actually trying to bridge the gap between university and uh, industry and 
providing a boot camp at it. However, in, in summary, I would say that all educational institutions need to focus on both aspects and depending upon their domain of specialization, where they are located, what their aspirations are, the mix of theory and practice can change. You cannot have a one-size-fit-all solution. That's right, sir. And we also understand the fact that there are institutions like TEFTA, there are institutions like the PSDF, which stands for the Punjab Skill Development Fund, which are actually working so as to ensure that, yes, not only students, but professionals per se, they have the requisite skills too, so as to not only gain a more competitive advantage, but also to ensure that whatever education that they do seek, that is more relevant in today's day and age. On which I'll come to you, because I feel that definitely there is a connectivity with your work here too. In this regard i do understand that you're running this organization purpose of which is to ensure that girls particularly a step further so as to ensure that they are trained to they are given the requisite skills so as to be able to seek a job as well so how does this whole equation entirely work and why do you feel it is so important that too for the rural population here miss mariam because they might be people who mm -hmm. might not be that highly qualified but if they have the basic skills they can at least be the breadwinners for their families Absolutely. Uh, you see, Fatma, the, the small work that I am doing in my in my village, which is in District Okara, my village is Vasavewala. So I have a, an elementary school for girls and side by side I have a computer class for, for young girls and women. And this computer class was set up uh, post-Covid, like mm. we, we made uh, a, an, an IT centre and it's equipped with the multimedia and computers and everything and after i made it i i didn't know what to do with it mm. so we actually this is accredited with the pvtc which is mm. punjab vocational and training council so six monthly courses are given to these young females mm. whose ages are 17 to 25 they could be of any age mm. and they come and they get equipped with these computer courses after after that we give them job placement mm. so they um, are th this is a technical support that we give them that mm. whoever comes after uh, they can be doing the after their inter or metric and mm. so the the point being that uh, an educated girl is going to make our future better and we make the role model my principal there is a female mm. and she is a masters and mm. she um, you know in in urban areas we have many examples in right. rural areas we have to create our examples I have right. to show uh, the girls in my school that what we are doing how it can take you further yeah. so my principal can bring her children she mm. she's married she's a homemaker and there's a daycare for her in the school. Yeah. She can bring her children and, and the students who are studying there, mm. they feel that, okay, when, when we do study uh, in higher education, we go a step further, we can marry off, mm. we can be homemakers. But even if you don't get that higher education at a very basic level, if you have those foundational skills. Yes. Make sure that the learning spaces are safe, mm. may, be it face-to-face -face or be it online, to mm. give our girl child a safe place to learn and to break stereotypes. So they are accessible to on which madam I'll come to you mm -hmm. I think Ms. Mariam has raised some very important points and I would want to quote the stats of this report which very clearly states that the gender gap in education in Pakistan more particularly in the rural girls is 45 percent lower than that in the urban girls and the same report also states that for boys uh, the difference is 10 percent only so we do understand that the gender disparity the gender gap that does exist in the education sector it is a very real problem what measures do you feel need to be taken holistically other than the work of the government is doing other than the work which perhaps people in the private capacities or for that matter the civil society is doing what is it that we need to focus upon so as to address this issue i personally I really think uh, there should be no gender discrimination anywhere mm. in any part of the mm. world, especially mm. in Pakistan. Um, uh, we have a bit type of a culture where there is there is always a bit priority mm -hmm. of the male child as comparative to the female child. Mm -hmm. So I personally think there should be reserved seats in universities, especially for um, um, female childs or females. Um, and the same way, you know, like when she was mentioning the, the lady was really a right, so saying that 
nowadays the women, the biggest barrier for women is that they got married, they got kids, how mm. they can work after that. Mm. So now they can work from home. They mm. can work on the social media, they can work online, they can do digital marketing, they can do uh, work for Amazon. There are so many platforms. Mm. If they have computer skills or they have technical skills, like in technical skills, they can be a beauty therapist, they can mm. be an aesthetician, they True. can work from home. So I personally think we should encourage like Tabata is doing it. They can People, be entrepreneurs to yeah, start yeah. We can mm. do like a woman bank, we can give mm. loans to them to start small businesses. Mm. We can motivate them, we can reserve their seats, we can do government funding. Mm. We can uh, ask government to specify certain funds just for the girls. So there are a lot of things can be done. When we do talk about, of course, addressing this gender gap, or for that matter, this uh, gender disparity, which does unfortunately exist with regards to our education system, this must then, at the end of the day, be a collective effort. Yes. On which I'll come to you, Ms. Mariam, and here we must talk about the link between being educated, more so between being highly educated and being tolerant as well, because uh, we do see this is something which has come forward again and again, that just because you're highly educated doesn't mean that you're highly tolerant as well, because we do understand the fact that somebody who is highly educated might perhaps get that competitive advantage to walk out of so many situations which perhaps somebody who is not as educated would. I think this can be curbed with education only. This hmm. can be, when we teach all children the same thing, the only education, education and education can do that. We tell our children uh, in our books and we teach them at home. I think mm. we put too much stress on, on books only and on teachers only. This is mm. something that has to be taught at home. Being tolerant, being uh, non-discriminatory towards race, creed, religion. Mm. This comes, a huge responsibility comes on the parents also. True. That uh, what they give, what environment they give to their child, if they are privileged enough, I think they should, they have a higher responsibility mm. to teach their children how to treat people who are are less privileged hmm. or who deserve more to be treatedly with respect if they if they have something less and how to be more giving hmm. so more so it is the responsibility of of the people who have the opportunity to be educated and who do have uh, you know the means to be more tolerant to be doing more and showing their children in in that respect that you have to be more giving that's mm. how society works of it's course. not the um, i think here uh, there, there's a, something that the educators can do something that the government can do but mostly it is uh, the parents duty also to to inculcate in their children mm. and in their minds and this is how we bring about and this change is very in the new important. generation you're very right because this very issue we also understand the fact that those people who perhaps might not be that highly qualified yes. they are automatically put at a disadvantage yes. because in terms of job, in terms of their marketability, in terms yes. of so many other things, people who are highly educated, they automatically get that advantage yes. that way too. Yes. Uh, on which I'll come to you, Suhail Sab, and here we must also talk about the need for us to actually strive so as to inculcate, you know, extracurricular activities, whatever they so may be, so as to make education a more holistic learning experience in this way. Because education, as we all understand, shouldn't just be something which prepares you for school, for college, for university, it should ideally aim to uh, prepare you for the real world too. Universities are places where uh, the students leave their homes and become young, independent, uh, productive human beings here. They then venture out of universities into the practical world and become productive members of the society. This transition from home uh, to the practical life that occurs through the university is a very important part of uh, human development for these uh, people. And it is important that besides uh, the academic work, the students are provided an opportunity for growth and personal development. What kind of growth, what opportunities that will depend upon the institution and also the likes and dislikes of that particular student. But we should have opportunities for sports, for example. We should have opportunities uh, uh, for uh, the students to take a variety of different types of uh, courses. If you are a math major, you should be studying philosophy. It is important. You should be studying literature also. You should have an opportunity uh, uh, to grow as a human being. So that 
means that the curriculum needs to be proper and diverse. You should also have opportunities uh, for doing debates, acting in dramas, running a music uh, club, and explore all different kinds of uh, interests uh, that, that you may have in an environment that is supported by the university that recognizes each person as a unique, diverse human being. And that's very rightly put by yourself, Suhesa, because we do see that this is something which is definitely prioritized in the West. Anvesha, you would want to add something to that because we do see that all these uh, students who are actually opting to go abroad, either for their undergrad or for that matter their postgrad, uh, there is this section which particularly asks them that, you know, what is it that is on their extracurricular record and that yeah. is something which definitely adds more weight to their applications. Yes, yes, so is. why can we not have something like this in Pakistan too? Yes. Um, yeah, you're very right, and um, you raised this question in a very positive direction. I totally agree with that because we are a human which contribute different characteristics mm -hmm. and qualities. Mm -hmm. Just having good grades mm -hmm. or good in practical skills mm -hmm. doesn't make you a good leader mm -hmm. or a good organizer or governance True. or administrator. Mm -hmm. So there are so many things like you should be good in human resource management, mm -hmm. you should have empathy, you should have courtesy, mm. your upbringing. You should be you know, socially aware. Socially aware. Mm. You should people in caring. So there's so many things like uh, extra. Right, madam. But moving on, my last question to you would then be that if we do aspire to, of course, improve the Pakistani education system and then in turn also bring it at par with various other education systems, especially those which are considered to be the best in the world, more particularly Finland, I would want to refer to in this regard. How do you propose can that be done? Do we need to revamp our education? policies do we need to redesign the curriculum content or do you feel it is the teaching methodologies that we need to focus upon I think it's a collective approach and uh, the basic thing I would say is standardization hmm. because what I felt is even you know person who's a doctorate of medicine or a doctor hmm. they go to UK they have to do plap again hmm. well that's not fair hmm. but as comparatively if we um, look at neighboring countries they have recognized their universities so their doctors um, mm. They go there and they start working there. So standardization, mm. validity, credibility, mm. authenticity mm. of your education system is really important. And obviously, if there's any, um, if you need to redesign the infrastructure, the slavers, the curriculum that needs to be done, then we should take um, the positive steps towards it. So we should keep our values, mm. but we should also adopt what's the good points mm. um, from them as well and it's more acceptable there. That's what I felt, you know, we're a tiny bit behind, mm. that sometimes our degrees are not as accepted mm. in um, abroad countries. So definitely that is something that we need to work upon. And in this regard, it's also very important then to highlight that overall, the literacy rate in the country has gone up more so from 45% to 63%, particularly in the last one decade. Mm. And this is something upon which you could also yeah. shed light as well, because we do understand that yes, the Pakistan Pakistan's education system has evolved and definitely it evolved is. for the better. But mm. what more can be done? Because again, you have that experience of working with mm. the government and privately too. What more reform would you suggest in this regard so as to then again bring it at par with you know various other education systems all over the world? Um, in my opinion, like we are already revamping and improvising, improving our curriculum. Mm. So we are working on the first part of uh, uh, the education, which is uh, the content, the mm. curriculum. We are working on the textbooks. We have authors. We are getting them reviewed by different uh, good, reputable, and mm. we are co collaborating with people. The government is collaborating. They are mm. getting our books are being published and being written by good. We we have good good authors also, mm. and our textbooks are being published by good people um, in the sense that the paper quality is better so stuff like that so the content textbooks now the main thing is the teacher hmm. so I cannot stress enough about the capacity building of teachers that's the 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 best thing that we can do is the professional development hmm. for our teachers the capacity building for that True. we can collaborate with international organizations hmm. and we can have teachers training and the I think uh, the best motivator is uh, if we give our teachers 
they're good in monetary incentives, hmm. their pay scales should be uh, increased Raised. as hmm. in every industry you pay a person to their, um, to their skill set, our teachers are underpaid, hmm. so that's why hmm. sometimes they're demotivated. Hmm. So skills of the teachers is what our education system is really depending on hmm. and our future generations are depending on that also. Right. I think that's one uh, phase that we need to work on hmm. and of course the infrastructure, again if you're going into the digital uh, phase and the digital transformation, then there's a lot of budget that needs to be allocated for the education and sector. And then here again, the role of social media also becomes mm. very important. Absolutely. Which, as we all understand, is a double-edged sword as we speak, mm. yes. because it has had that benefit of educating people, but then also, of course, it is um, adding to people, say, disrupting the social morality of the society too. So it is something which comes with its baggage as well. Yes. Uh, sir, I'll come to you, and before we conclude today's show, here it's very important then to also talk about not only overall aiming to improve higher education as it does exist in Pakistan, because we do understand that, yes, higher education is something which is extremely pivotal for national development. But in this regard too, what focus must equally be placed on research-based work, which apparently, at least to some extent, appears to be missing in our education system? At a national level, it is extremely important uh, that the leadership of the country uh, has a vision for higher education uh, in uh, Pakistan. Higher education uh, is the solution to Pakistan's economic woes, political woes, and all other issues that the country uh, faces because you are taking advantage of the single most important asset of the country, which is the young, fertile, trained human mind that we have. And uh, once the leadership understands that, then you are looking at your natural resources and you are saying what is the best way to provide uh, value addition and to have the maximum economic benefit. And that means you will then be focusing on the human faculties that will have the mass maximal economic transformative uh, impact uh, on the country. We cannot do everything, but uh, we should be looking at the areas where we can excel. Let's, in every work that we will do, we must be competing internationally. There cannot be a concept of developing in Pakistan higher education that will not meet and exceed global standards. It has to be open and just as we take advantage of all the knowledge that is out there, they should be able to take the advantage of the knowledge that we have. The advantage Pakistan has is the young people, abundance of this talent. Let us make that as our priority number one. Uh, right, sir, your point is noted. On which note, I would like to conclude today's show. Thank you so much, Ms. Talha. Thank you so much, Ms. Mariam. And thank you so much, sir, for your time today. Well, to conclude today's show, we generally spoke about the ever-evolving education and education system as it does stand in the Pakistani society. In this regard, a very welcome move that we do see is the fact that over a period of time, post-COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen Pakistan's education you know, system overall embrace technology, which is definitely something which needs to be welcomed. But in this regard, what is equally important to consider is the fact that we need to equally consider and, of course, do away with the digital divide in this regard too more so that which then does exist between the rural as well as the urban population. Last but not the least, we need to ensure that, of course, learning, that, of course, education is a very holistic, you know, experience where people are not only taught to root learn stuff, but at the same time, they are also taught that ability to critically question things because we understand that the true goal of any education, the true goal of any education system is just not learning, but it is also to be able to critically question things. Thank you for watching The Society. Until next time, take care and love this.